This is the voice of Great Britain calling from the United States of America. Kore wa Amerika gashu kok kara yobu e kok no koe des. At Heart Mountain, Wyoming, a recruiter came to our camp to interview people with knowledge of Japanese to be employed in Denver. And I accepted the invitation and I was interviewed. And about two months later, I received a letter for me to report to Denver to be employed with the British Political Warfare Mission. And I went to Denver to be introduced to my director and my fellow workers. And from there, I started to work in translation and broadcasting. And our work day started at six o'clock in the evening, and we worked till nine o'clock on translation and also putting together our broadcast itinerary and everything. And by 10 o'clock, we had to finish everything and be ready for broadcast, which we started at 11 o'clock at night in a radio station on the Albany Hotel in Denver. We were using the same studios as the Office of War Information, which was the equivalent to our British Political Warfare Mission. And they were the first to do their broadcasting. And after they were finished, we were uh, put in to do our broadcasting. Our newscast was mostly concerned about the Pacific <coughs> area. And we were broadcasting news that we were sure that some of the Japanese people were not receiving. And we were just detailing the progress of the war. And that was our job. Most of the articles uh, that we were told to translate came across the In those days, we only had what they call a teletype. And the uh, uh, news was coming from the Associated Press and from the government release presses. And for those articles were given to us for translate and to broadcast. My director in Denver was Mr. Delamar, who is a citizen of the British. And he was, he uh, monitored all our translation and everything. He was very fluent in Japanese and he would review everything that we did and he was responsible for anything that was broadcast. And when we were finished with our broadcast, we signed off by saying, this is San Francisco. We ourselves believed that for the safety of ourselves, that it was better for us not to talk at all because there may be some people that wouldn't agree to what we were doing and we feared for our life. We got over to the Philippines. There were 600, about 650. And apparently before the bomb was dropped, there was a plan already of, of the invasion of Japan. And they needed more linguists with all the fighting divisions that would uh, go into Japan. So we got to Manila and uh, there really wasn't anything for us to do. When we got to Manila, they made us climb down those ropes uh, on a, a, a salt ship, got onto uh, uh, the amphibious uh, craft to take us to the shore, put us on trucks, and the Filipinos are throwing rocks at us because features the Japanese, you know, even though we had U.S. military equipment. So 
We kind of laughed about that. Once the air bomb was dropped, my division had, con uh, had contacted one of us interpreters to come back, pick up a leaflet stating the fact that the emperor had surrendered and that they, the, to tell the remaining Japanese forces wherever they were hiding out to surrender, come out and surrender. I joined the other linguists and I said, Yama, I said, they're not coming out. So he says, well, let's go looking for them. And I said, hey, the war is over. We they surrendered. Why should we risk our lives now? We might get shot. But he insisted that he's going to go, so I didn't want him to go alone. So uh, we both went looking. And when we got down to the bottom of the trail, and all of a sudden, from behind the rocks, uh, about four or five Japanese soldiers uh, came out and pointed the rifles at us and told us to stop. Of course, all in Japanese, and of course, we stopped. And when we had to explain to them then that no, we're, we're Japanese, just like you, but we were born in the United States, and my parents come from Japan. We were born and raised in America, so we were fighting for the America. You're Japanese, you're fighting for the emperor, right? We went inside this cave, a huge opening, where we saw this one un soldier laying on the, uh, on the floor, and he had a staff of officers sitting around him, so we knew that must have been the commander, and uh, we explained to him what had happened, and uh, we said, uh, if we could take this soldier that we talked to, if he's willing to come with us, we can take him back to our CP, and we may be able to pick up some uh, communication. We took the soldier and we went to the uh, at the communication section there and to listen. And it happened to be what the emperor had already uh, surrendered speech. He says, well, I, we, I, he believes this is true now. And he says, I can convince my commanding officer we got maybe three, four hundred soldiers still holding out. We're all hiding out down there. Oh my goodness. He spent the night with us. We talked about uh, our families in Japan and so forth. And we had a nice uh, conversation with this Japanese soldier, where he was from and his family and all that. And. So anyway, the very next day, <coughs> uh, we see this convoy. There was this jeep. It happened to be our division commander, which was a brigadier general. He says, I, I came out here because I had to see this in my own eyes. Uh, what you're saying is true. I hope it's true. We came out of the cave, and out where these soldiers were all lined up. My God, there was about four abreast, all lined up, uh, lined up towards the top of the top of the uh, beach there, where they were uh, the trail. And <laughs> this general was really—he he was really surprised to see all of them coming out. <laughs> 